Professor Nigel Sheffold. Um, he's from the University of Southampton and he's furthermore member of the Public Sector Transparency Board of the United Kingdom. So he has direct like contact with the Prime Minister and uh, you know in Switzerland we don't have a Prime Minister with such executive force so maybe that's the reason why in the UK open government data is a little bit more far already. And furthermore, Nigel Sheppold is director of the Open Data Institute in London, and that he is together with the well-known Tim Berners-Lee. So Nigel Sheppold, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, it's the end of a long, hot, warm day. Um, hot and warm is not something we're very familiar with at the moment in the UK. Um, of course, I'm told that Swiss audiences get more and more kind of animated as the day goes through. That's it. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Okay, just for the avoidance of doubt, that's what open data is. Um, actually, it's quite important. Um, free to use, reuse, and redistribute. Subject only. At most, the requirement to share and share alike. Okay, that's a good definition. Just bear that in mind. I am going to talk today. You will probably be aware that I have a number of hats, a number of perspectives and roles. On the one hand, I'm a founder of a company, uh, actually a, a number of companies over the years. This one is one that specializes in, in the use of linked data. So I have an interest in data, linked data, data on the web. One hat. I like to make enterprise as successful companies based on these ideas. But I'm also, as uh, was uh, just indicated, a, a member of an advisor to government. An advisor, not paid, important, not paid, an advisor. If you're not an advisor and you're not paid, you can sometimes be critical. In fact, you can quite often be critical, that's useful. So um, we'll see. Not just um, open data, but a very interesting program called My Data, which I will talk about in passing at the end. And more recently, another hat, three hats, uh, director of the Open Data Institute, which is um, uh, a new uh, development in London that I'll talk about. Okay, so the key in all of this, different roles, is the power of data. And I want to just remind ourselves of where we are. I can't believe it's just over a year, burn, June 23rd or 24th last year. Um, and the story continues, open the data, the applications follow, not built by government, built by other people. At all scales, governments, cities, regions, these slides I can still use. The difference is there's more and more and more data portals on them. And I put one on today. There we go, there we go, there we go. That's Eurix. Okay? It's there with 89 data sets. And the question is, how many of them do you care about? Okay? And that's what we'll come back to. And in fact, you know, lots of portals, you can ask the same question. How much do you care about the data in that portal? And we understand now lots of good reasons why we do this. Transparency and accountability, which sometimes make politicians feel nervous. Better public services, which they like, and improved efficiency. People improving the data itself. We've got lots of examples, and in the UK we've been living this as we see data sets put out there that we finally get released and people go, this is terrible data. <laughs> okay. How can we make it better? Why has the government got such bad data? Rufus touched on some of these points today. Improving efficiency, creating social value. Social value, just every bit as important as economic capital, but actually socially important, whether it's stopping people getting killed, through accidents on the road, which of course has an economic cost too, and a huge humanitarian and uh, human cost. And this bottom one, which um, Andre asked me to talk about, kind of exploring this notion of what's the economic value, because actually, when you have reluctant politicians, maybe it's the money that will talk. So we'll have a look at that. Okay, now that's the kind of, you know, if it's all so straightforward, and I spent six minutes talking about why it's all straight, straw, so straightforward, who needs to say anything else? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I will say some more, because we need a lot of other preconditions, okay? This only works, all those good things only happen if you have a steady stream of success. 
And what counts as success? Actually, well, one thing that works is is saving money and also saving lives. That's good. Okay, so in the UK, one of our success stories is this. This is the superbug MRSA, multiply resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It kills people in hospitals who get the infection or makes them very ill. In fact, a few years ago in the UK, it was killing a lot of people and making a lot of people ill. 5,000 cases a year in our hospitals, 9,000 pounds each to treat them. That's a lot of money. That's millions of pounds, okay? And then we started to publish the data. A leak table of all the hospitals and how many cases of MRSA they were reporting. How many people were getting ill through this infection? Hospitals at the top, who had lots of cases, or maybe not, which way you order the kind of list, of course, highest to lowest. Let's suppose the best were at the top. And at the bottom were the hospitals who had most cases. And they would look at that, and people did not want to be at the bottom, okay? And wondered how the people at the top were doing so well. It wasn't the only reason, but one of the main reasons that we have seen an 85% decrease in infection rates in hospitals is because people learned from each other how to make it better, because the data was published. 45 million pounds in saving for a start. Lots of lives saved. Those are good stories. So are accident data, well-known poster child for open data. This is a site taking um, accidents recorded in, in London. This is Trafalgar Square, busy area, accidents happen, okay? Can you learn from that? Can people actually write apps that avoid these things? Success stories like that that are easy to grasp and simple, get through to the public and politicians, that's what you need. Find your own, find the ones that matter. But to really make a case for that, you've got to release data that matters. Actually, hospital infections are difficult data for governments to release because if things are not going well, people would rather perhaps not know about it always, okay? So, this is the trick. Release data that matters. In the UK, one we're quite proud of. I talked about it last year. A lot's happened since we had just released the crime data. This is the postcode in, uh, for the... Um, for the actual area in Southampton where my university is. In fact, my building is just there. And these is a heat map of the antisocial and violent crimes occurring in one month in that postcode. Small area, about 500, uh, uh, just over 500 yards by 500 yards, kilometer by kilometer, uh, I think this resolution here. Every month, we publish every reported crime in the UK at the street level, okay? Except for some, just a few which are redacted in terms of their position. The occurrence is noted, but not where. Violent domestic crime, for example, is not associated with. But much of the rest is. So this is one month, just where we are. This is the next month. This is the next month. You can see sort of a pattern, okay, right? Now, the point about this data is that people notice this. And in fact, the apps are now preferred apps by the police because they can get this stuff on their mobile phone while they're working on the beat, whilst they're patrolling the area, and their own IT systems, how long would it have taken them to come up with this visualization, okay? There is an official police site, but the data has been released, so people innovate around it. This was difficult data to release. In fact, it took a real case of political bravery because they were being told that public confidence would disappear when this stuff was released. Actually, it's been hugely successful, very popular. All the problems and issues around uh, public identification, uh, issues around privacy, people want more, not less. That's the overwhelming lesson of this. People would like to join the reported crimes up to whether anybody was actually convicted for the crime. So what was the justice outcome for these things? Okay. Well, we can argue about the pros and cons, but data that matters is what matters. Uh, in the UK, performance in schools, or again, a great health example, how well are particular surgeons doing at particular kinds of operations? Interesting. Or here, weather. Our weather data in the UK is finally available as of autumn. We have a public weather service which publishes, publishes five days out the forecast data for 5,000 places around the UK at three hourly intervals. 
That resolution of data, and this was data I downloaded this morning for Southampton Airport, predicting 96 hours out, a whole range of attributes. People can build apps that specialize for insurance, washouts, various logistics. Before, you could only buy these services from the Met Office because the data wasn't available unless you paid a lot of money for it if very small few people had the kind of deals going that would allow you to do this. This one, just announced today, I'll come back to what was just announced today because it's been quite an interesting day to be away from the UK. Um, I, we didn't realize it when we set this uh, uh, talk up. We are going to be releasing detail of healthcare again. This is the provision of care in care homes or the care you get from the state when people come into your home when you're elderly. Demographics in Europe are going one way. We're all going to get older. The bill for doing that is going to get more and more expensive. And we want to know things like how good are all these privately supplied services, a big growth area in the UK, care homes. So now a group of these providers have agreed from today to publish this kind of data, staff turnover. Not all of them, but a group have. Now, will this drive up quality? Okay, it's not all about price here. It's people will make a choice now based on how quickly do the staff turn over, how many are trained, how many complaints, how many people in that care home are getting pressure ulcers, which indicates they're not moving about much or they're not being moved about much. Yeah? How many medication errors? How many appointments have been missed for people coming into your home if you're being supplied? This, again, is data that can help improve and hold account but it's quite difficult. But the challenge is, do you want to make your society better? Do you want to get your taxes paid, spent more efficiently or not? Now, to make all of this happen, and this is, I remember uh, we had an excellent conversation with, uh, with, with, uh, with various members of Swiss Topo, the Swiss mapping agency, around this whole notion of location. Location, location, location. You've got to get some core data out there. You've got to get your core geography released freely. That is a huge enabler for innovation. You can't build an economic case for open data with no mapping data. And if you won't provide it as the state, then people will come and occupy that area, whether it's OpenStreetMap or whether it's Apple's offering or a closed offering from other suppliers. Let's think about what we can achieve. And in the UK, 14 core products were released that have made things very possible that weren't before. Postcodes, for example, so that now applications can show us just how well the postcodes are doing in terms of crime rates or transportation delays. This one is a, lo a lovely map of London, again, using ordnance survey data to look at bicycle routes and pollution levels. So the thickness corresponds to the number of routes, and the red there is telling you how much pollution is being recorded there. Or well, this one, which is about urban deprivation. This is an update of some classic work in the 19th century in the UK on how deprived certain areas are. You've got to be able to, everything happens somewhere, okay? And you need to know how and where. Your apps need to have that liberated. We haven't solved all of this in the UK, by the way, and my uh, particular disappointment is we can't get a national address file released as a core reference data set, right? We pay an outrageous amount of money to a closed monopoly for this, and, well, I'll come back to that, okay. So, it isn't, you know, don't think that we know how, how to do all of this, and there's always an argument about the local monopolies within the state that have been set up, and they've been told that they have to ch cover some of their costs, so quite naturally they work out what they can charge for their data. It's not as if they're being, anything other than responsive to what the state is telling them to do. But sometimes you have to take a decision that there's a bigger value in here, and how do you size that uh, possibility, which is really going to be the, the second part of my talk here. Okay, now data needs to be easily found. Actually, we've released a lot of it. If it's going to have any economic value, you've got to be able to find it. We rapidly discovered that this site, which was our data.gov.uk site, it was really hard to find stuff, okay? The search was pretty poor. And um, this is it now. We've actually released a new version of data.gov.uk today. 
Um, it looks a bit different. I'm very, very glad to see they don't think they've got the problem done. I'd have got very grumpy if they'd have removed beta from the... Uh, this is still under development. We don't know how to make these portals optimal. But here we can now do a lot more around looking and searching for apps. And in fact, um, driven by a much richer metadata representation in CCAN, we can, we can begin to look at a whole richer range. This is a particular data set. It's one of those infection, MRSA infection data from the NHS. Whole bunch of attributes. And in fact, a little placeholder in here for something I'll come back to. So we've just, the reason it was a red letter day is that today we uh, released the open, new open data white paper in the UK. It was meant to have happened two weeks ago, but things got slowed down. I had uh, committed to coming here, so it was released. <laughs> but it's been an exciting day. Take a look at it. There's some very interesting commitments in that white paper. Uh, one of them is to actually rate all data according to the Berners-Lee five-star grade, okay? Which will be really interesting. Most of the data that we release, if you're lucky, is a CSV file. What we'd like to do is get people thinking about using, if not all the complexity of RDF in triple source, using these things. These things are stable IDs for data on the web. And these things are the sorts of things that governments can generate and own. So, web addresses for your national infrastructure, like postcodes, like schools, like pollution outlets, and ministries and departments are data authorities. They've got the ability to generate identifiers that can then be used across government to link stuff together. Okay. A lot of this is about changing behavior. It isn't about technology, it's a bit about technology, it's largely about changing behavior. To move from a presumption, to, to, to move from the civil servant thinking this is my data and it might embarrass me, to thinking this data has huge value made available. And in fact, one of the things that we did in the UK, uh, and I'd recommend them uh, to any country looking at this, because we, we, we took some of these from, from US insights as well. So we're all trying to share each other's best insights. We had a, a set of draft public data principles. And today, they have become, with modification, government policy. Now, you've got to enforce government policy, but that's a powerful step when you build commitments to machine readability, commitments to open licenses into this effort. Now, you've got to recognize that this stuff has economic value. So coming on then to the bit you really wanted me to talk about, the economic piece. Partly the market's got to recognize and think this might be the case. One interesting thing that's just come out is, is a report by Deloitte on open data, gro driving growth, ingenuity, and innovation. Deloitte, one of the big kind of consulting houses, uh, they were working with, with, with a group of us to say, you know, how do we explain this to business? What's, what's the business interest in this and where is the value? Uh, we've had the, uh, and I think you can only do that by showing examples. You need open data businesses, not just social NGOs, not just students, not just hacktivist events. You've got to have people making money, trying to build commercial success out of open data. Because the truth of it is that a supply side of open data will not long survive if you don't have a demand side. You need people to consume this stuff. So here's a few examples. I think this is always going to be a potential win for business and businesses. Uh, we got a great little app just come out in the UK. I just downloaded it, paid £1.49 for it on my own for iPhone. And it rates GPs. Every general practitioner, we have 11 million data points for surveys taken across all GPs in the UK. I was looking at my location, looking at my doctors, thinking, I'm in the wrong practice. <laughs> there are many examples in the health area. I think they're going to start to emerge with these open data assets. There's an app to show you the infection rates in the hospitals to tell you which are good. 
I mean, sometimes you might not feel you've got, you've, got, you've got any kind of choice in the matter as you're taken into accident and emergency, but at least you can think, um, oh no, or oh yes. <laughs> Okay, this one's great. Parkopedia, quite famous app. This is the one, again, you can download it for just a few pounds on your app, and this will show you where the local parking is, whether there are, and for some of those that are opted in, you can see just how many places are currently available. This is Chris Taggart's, a really great example, open corporates, partly driven by the fact that he couldn't get the actual registry of uh, companies from Companies House. He went away and crawled huge amounts of other resources to integrate together. He's now got an open register of over 43, I'm sure it's more than that now, million corporate entities around the world. You know. And that, of course, and their directors and their accounts and their registered office, officers. And when you're trying to tie up business with spending, Business intelligence, this stuff has real value, okay? And I'd be interested to see which of these kind of get sold off the, the most money at some point, or possibly they'll, they'll expand to be a great business in their own right. Spending, uh, Spike Scavell, Spotlight on Spend, uh, compares all of the fine-grained spending data that we now have from local government in the UK. Every one of 360, bar one, every one of 360 uh, local authorities has to publish their spending above 50 pounds, or is it 500 pounds? I think maybe 500 pounds, actually. But that's still a lot. I mean, 500 pounds is quite a small unit of interest every month, okay? And what they can do, of course, is compare whether this area is paying the same as or different for this kind of service as another area, and lots of kind of procurement analysis going on here. There are companies being set up that are kind of the equivalent of data publishers. So in, the, in London, there's this company Jonathan Raper set up called Placer, which sells open, real-time traffic data and services associated back into developers and uh, organizations who have an interest in real-time transport data. And of course, interestingly, the big system integrators are starting to show some interest. Microsoft have released an open government data platform in Azure, in the cloud, free to you. Well, you know, it's... <laughs> but that's showing you something really interesting. Big corps are starting to see the opportunity in this space because actually what they're going to think about this, lots of data released, is lots of data to be hosted somewhere, is lots of services to find it and build services around it. And actually, if you begin to look at some of the companies who are saying, well, maybe we can actually publish our own data. It doesn't have to be just data from government. And if I look at these companies, interestingly, at least these two here, Enel and Nike, have done it because of trust in their customer base for various reasons. Environmental power, power stations, sweatshops in Southeast Asia, Sometimes you might think, maybe we are going to have to do better than this. Maybe we're going to think about how well we're doing. And if we're doing well, why don't we tell the world about it? So they publish data now on, on areas that in the past they had issues of trust around. Or ASOS and Music Metric, two companies that actually make their data available about their core products to try and get other people to write apps to make their products better and sell. You need an ecosystem. This isn't just, about, isn't just about government giving data out. We're increasingly going to see, I believe, business consuming and supplying. We're increasingly going to see people consuming and supplying. Now, this gets into this difficult area where people think, oh, privacy, oh, it's my data. I believe there'll be a significant area where significant amounts of data is released on a permissive basis not by governments, but by these people whose data it is. One place we need to get to in that is to give people the empowerment to get their own data back from governments, from the NHS, from the health systems, from the tax systems, or from the companies who supply them energy. In the UK, we have an initiative called My Data, where the big power companies are beginning to release data back to individuals so that they can actually trade, switch, collectively purchase together. Very interesting development. So this world, 
the personal information assets world is going to intersect very soon with an open data world. So I can't say too much about that. These things need nurturing. So just two, three minutes on the Open Data Institute. This initiative in the UK is really based around trying to understand what we might need to do to make economic markets work. Um, and there's a bunch of things we've been tasked to do. It's not like we've got tons of money. Uh, we've got two million pounds a year from the government for five years, 10 million pounds, uh, which we have to match from corporates. But what we're trying to do is incubate young, small startups with open data. Talk to the public providers of data. Talk to big corporates about how we can help them make their data more effectively available. So that's going to be exciting. We're looking forward to that. We'll be launching for business from September onwards. Watch this space. And finally, if you've not believed any of this or a single word of it, think of the money, OK? If it won't do it for humanity, or you won't do it to save souls, or you won't do it to think of the money. Now, this is a, my great example. This is California's transparency portal, which cost them $21,000 a year and was saving them reportedly. This is where people would go on and report misspending, okay, or contracts that seem wasteful. They were reportedly saving about $20 million a year on that. Governor Jerry Brown shut it down in March. Okay. Now, you can ask yourself why. Um, California got a big, big cross in the box when it did that. Lots of other states have been opening up their spending portals because they see that there's value to be had. But I'm just pointing out, sometimes it's very political. But whose money is it? Uncovers $3 billion of fraud. This is a great example. David Eve quotes from Canada. Sounds like an incredible amount. This was when they noticed that there were lots of charities in Canada claiming relief. And when they started to look at the open data from charities registers, they suddenly realized that lots of these companies weren't really companies at all. Okay, so fraud. Or oh, this one, I'm oh, sorry, I'm nearly finished. This is two million euros gets you 62 million euros. This is back to the address file. This is Dan Denmark's address file, which it did release. It cost them that much. They think it probably generated that much value in the economy. They think that the 0.2 million it cost in one year generated that much in 2010. There are economic studies that show you the precise value of particular data sets now. I keep waving this in front of the Royal Mail. It saves lives. I've talked today about MRSA. I it creates value. This is the $50,000 of awards that Washington DC, District of Columbia spent, and they reckon they got $2. million of free developer applications out of that. Or you can argue about the weather data that's free in the US that generates this size of market in the US. We can think about 32 billion in the PSA market in Europe, but if you don't believe that, believe these. So. What you need to do is think about where your examples could be. Try and size them. I believe you have some. OK, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Nigel Shetbold, for this, again, thriving uh, statement or speech. So the floor is yours. Have you any questions? You can all just say yes, okay? You can also speak, uh, you can also speak in German, French, or even Romansch Grijun. If it's not Latin, I talk Romansch Grijun. Yeah. Uh, it's less a question than a general comment, and uh, as impressed as I am by everything that has been taking place in, in the UK. Uh, I'm just thinking of, of the massive uh, problems and the time we would lose in, in trying to do 10% of this in Switzerland and, <laughs> and how difficult it would be. And uh, that, that's quite admirable. Well, this uh, is, I don't know, look, listen, I mean. But no, I'm just taking one example, the thing about criminality, yeah. for instance. Yeah. Well, first of all, criminality is, uh, is a responsibility of the various cantons in Switzerland. So before you get the, to all 26 of them to agree on 
letting <laughs> that be accessed, uh, in, uh, including geographical uh, elements as well. Goodness, this would take forever. Uh, uh, well, uh, in like many instances, I've, I have good ideas. I, in many instances, I was inspired by some few things that might be re some doable. Things, look, I mean, yeah. Some things we find really hard in the UK are easier elsewhere, right? We have our own problems, bruising our toes. It's, it, and, and in fact, um, the, the police one's a good example. We, we have 49 different police constabularies in England and Wales. Okay, we don't have one police force. And a lot of those chief constables, no, 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 no. So, it, it, and, and of course, how you mobilize people. Um, you have the most distributed democratic kind of form of government in the world, I suspect. And it's interesting to me how, as you try and raise issues up, one of the arguments I hear is, we don't need this, we're democratic already, everything's transparent. Well then show us the bloody spending data. Okay, show us the contract data. A really, really good example is contract finders, you know, where you can actually go and find out which money has been spent on which corporation. Not because, and actually corporations need to know this too. So, or start somewhere simple. You know, we started partly with a lucky accident, literally, um, of, of Tim having, having lunch with a previous prime minister and then the whole thing got sufficiently interesting that the opposition took it up and have taken it forward when they become the new, the, the new government. We were lucky to have a race with the Americans. Everybody starts to pile in. They will get it. They will get it. You will not remain unique forever, but your touch points where you can succeed will not necessarily be the same. Each country has its initial victories, and they can be different, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, it could be that the revolutionary cadre in Switzerland are your cities and your cantons, and not the, not the federal piece, but who knows. Um, Any more? So... No, shut up. There's one more. Yeah, take one more. So one more question, and then we switch to the next speaker. So you, you spoke about this market between data providers and uh, data uh, sellers, and you were actually arguing we should uh, try and make cases. So the one story you didn't bring that seemed to have worked a lot in the open source community is, is the shared freemium model. Yeah. Uh, do, do you believe it will not work? I mean, I'm maybe not in the OGD, but in the OD domain, it seems like uh, many people are betting on the freemium model uh, for many kinds of data. I think that's a really uh, important point. I, I would say that it would really help if we had some really systematic and good economics on this. We don't really see the studies or the high-grade economists piling into this challenge. And I think that... So, yeah, I think it will come through, and I think you will see the, the long-tail effects, the multipliers, the externalities, the costs, the marginal costs that kind of outweigh anything else you're spending. But um, we, in a sense, have been so quick to publish this stuff out. And in some cases, the experiment's quite difficult to do because the before wasn't measured, and the after is now here. So I think in some case, I think the World Bank and, and others are thinking about this evidence case quite seriously. Um, so I think we should look for it there, and I think we do need to do those, uh, some serious studies around that. Thank you very much, Nigel Shetbold. You may... Yeah.